I can reflect on my life when I'm outside. I, I pray. I have memories of my childhood. I think about my dad who's passed away. I think about my grandma. I have my mother here with me still. And we can laugh and dig in the dirt. And I feel safe. My, my farm is my safe haven. Nothing touches me from the outside world here on my land. A movement is underway of people abandoning the emotional, physical, and financial expenses of city living and crafting their own purpose, livelihoods, and joy in the rural reaches. The Urban Exodus podcast shares the wisdom, wit, and stories of those who decided to embark on the road less traveled to pursue their own interpretation of the good life. Small business owners, change makers, artists, farmers, and more, working towards building a better future for themselves and their fellow citizens. This podcast is for country dreamers, rural folk, and urban dwellers alike who want to feel more connected to the natural world and the purpose and choices in their lives. I'm Melissa Hessler. Welcome to the Urban Exodus. I'm excited to invite you to my conversation with Marco Candelario. Marco is an author, a visual artist, and the owner and operator of a female-run, multi-generational family farm in Oconee County, Georgia. Marco runs young female farmers with her mother and her three daughters. They offer fresh produce, baked goods, and wild-crafted tinctures. Marco started her career on Wall Street, but after the birth of her daughter, her and her husband decided to move to rural Georgia. Although she loved the blue sky and fresh air, she felt like a fish out of water and had a difficult time adjusting and finding work. Coming from a successful career in finance, the only jobs she could find in Georgia were low-paying service positions. Her husband, Phil, seeing Margot struggle to find gainful employment, offered to be the sole financial provider for their family so that Margot could stay at home with their daughters. Leaving the workforce was a welcomed refocus until tragedy struck. While pregnant with their third daughter, Phil suffered a massive heart attack and passed away at the age of 34. Margot became a single mother overnight and had to find a way to take care of her family. Weighing her limited options, she decided that the only path forward as a pregnant single mother was to start her own business. She began making sweet potato pies and selling them at farmer's markets, and then expanded into fresh produce, making a point to visit food deserts in their area to provide fresh vegetables to people in her community that wouldn't otherwise have access. Farming and entrepreneurship allowed Margot to bloom and build a beautiful new chapter for herself and her girls. In our conversation today, we speak about Margot's journey from Wall Street to rural Georgia, healing through the soil, and the wisdom she's gathered through following her heart's path all these years. This is a story about family, love, overcoming extreme tragedy, and celebrating life. I hope you enjoy it. So I'm really excited to invite to the podcast today, Margot Candelario from Young Female Farmers. And I met you, Margot, online, you know, a couple of years ago, quite honestly. I love the story of your farm. I love that your farm is three, going on now four generations of women. And I love the products that you make every morning. I put your tinctures into my green smoothie (laughs) and I feel very healthy and rejuvenated from them. And I'm just really excited to have you on the show and to share your story. Well, I am really excited too that you invited me. Of course. Well, first off, I guess I'd love to just hear a little bit of your personal backstory, where you grew up and your journey to where you are now. I grew up in the 60s 
in San Bernardino, California, which back then was a very strong military town. My dad was in the Air Force. He was actually stationed at George Air Force Base in Victorville. He and my mom had a home in San Bernardino, and I was born at Norton Air Force Base. So with that said, it was a community full of transplants. People from all over the United States migrated to San Bernardino, well, California for that matter, but San Bernardino because of the military bases that were there in that area. And so I got a chance to grow up with a lot of people from many different cultures, German, Filipino, Japanese, and everyone from the United States, from the Midwest and the South. And when they migrated to San Bernardino, they came with their cultural diversity, their knowledge, their know-how, their exposure, their experiences, their stories. And we just happened to live in an area on a block that had a lot of people that were older. They were seniors. So I've always been around older people and I was taught to listen to stories, you know, sit at the foot of the elders and hear their stories and their struggles. And and with them telling me these stories, it wasn't just to hear themselves talk, but it was to pass on their knowledge and their know-how, hoping that something would stick. And it did. The farming, <laughs> the farming, the, the, the animal husbandry, everything that I am today is because of the things that I learned as a child. From San Bernardino, when did you first get kind of your hands dirty? Were you working in any farms or working in any backyard gardens with any of the elders in your community then? Yes. And because my parents both are from Harlem, New York, their dream was to leave New York City, the concrete jungle, and move to California in the 50s. And so it was my father's dream to own a piece of property, buy a home. Anything outside of living in a tenement was a big feat for him. So to buy a house with his GI loan and have a little piece of property and have a farm growing vegetables and having horses and cows and chickens and dogs and cats and rabbits and birds and turtles. <laughs> <laughs> we had a menagerie of everything. So that was my exposure, kind of learning along with him. And the neighbors that I referred to earlier are the ones that taught him because he was from the city. He didn't know anything about going to auctions and and uh, bidding on cattle or horses, you know, so he was taught. Your parents had their own little urban exodus. <laughs> yes, they, they truly did. Yeah, and I just fell right into it. And being an only child, it was much easier for me to tag along with him and experience those things. So, you know, this was the exposure he afforded me. And I know that eventually you actually ended up back in New York City. I would love for you to kind of tell that story from after, you know, your, your childhood years. What, what drew you back to the city? I spent most of my summers in New York because my grandparents were there anyway. So I always had a connection to New York City. I felt more of a connection with the city than I did with California for various reasons, but my parents separated. And, and that's how my mom and I ended up going back to New York. When I was 17 and finished high school, I did 11th and 12th grade there in college. And, and it was a seamless transition for me because I had spent so many years going every year anyway. So I just moved, I slid right into the culture. I mean, after you graduated high school, what was your career path that you went into before you ended up farming? My first job, I worked at the World Trade Center for the um, New York State Attorney General's office in the Steno pool. It was through the co-op program at high school, you know, where you go, to, you go to class for like two classes and then you leave and you go to work. I thought I was grown. <laughs> I was making, I was making some money and I was traveling on the train downtown and dressing up and wearing heels and doing adult things. 
so that was the that was the first thing, the steno pool. And from the steno pool, I went into Wall Street working for a brokerage company, the Depository Trust Company. And then from there, I went to Thompson McKinnon. So I had uh, several years working on the street in finance. And I thought that that was going to be my career. But back in the 80s, there were several companies that were going bankrupt and Thompson McKinnon was one of them. So I felt like, all right, this is my time to get out because I was overworked. I got caught up in making big money at a young age. And I realized that this wasn't the path that I really wanted. I was enjoying making the money. I was enjoying traveling. I was enjoying buying the clothes that I wanted to and going out to eat. But it didn't fulfill some of those needs that I I had, that I kind of repressed being in the city. I know that, you know, the reason that you ended up moving to Georgia was really kind of returning to your husband's roots. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your husband and how you met and that move to Georgia. I met my husband. He had just gotten out of the military, the Air Force, after I had said to myself, I would never, ever marry a person that was in the military. <laughs> Isn't that funny how we that do that? Is funny, <laughs> yes. Um, it was just something about that that walk, his statue and his clothing and you know, he just I thought, wow, he really has it together. And he, he was coming for a job interview. I was doing the hiring and I knew the minute he walked in the door that, that was he was gonna get the job. <laughs> um, so um we met For our our first date, we were discussing in the break room how when you're in the city, people that live there often forget about the the wonders that New York City has to offer because we're just so entrenched in working. We don't do the museums. We don't do the parks, you know, just on special occasions. But for the most part, it's what tourists do. And I said, yeah, you know, I, I agree. He said, well, when was the last time you went to the museum? And I was like, yeah haven't been in in a while. He said, well, how about we do the museum this weekend? So I said, okay, fine. You know, so Wednesday comes along. He says to me, are you ready for the museum? I've got the tickets. And I'm thinking tickets. I mean, all we have to do is get on the train or take a cab downtown. He was like, oh, no, no, no. We're going to the Smithsonian. I said, whoa. (laughs) 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 <laughs> he's pulling out the guns, you know, so yeah. <laughs> we did the, the Smithsonian and we did a lot of interesting things, things that required mental stimulation, you know, and I, I really like that. Now he was, he was born and raised in the South Bronx, but his family was from Puerto Rico and he spent many years in Puerto Rico also. So getting to how we ended up in Georgia My mother had a best friend. She's passed away, but she lived here in Georgia. And I wanted to bring him down here to meet her. I grew up calling her aunt. And so I brought Phil down and he just was amazed at the blue sky, the trees, the clean air. And he thought, wow, this is this is where I want to raise my daughter. At that time, we just had one and we moved down here. And what was that transition like for you? And how long did it really take you to feel rooted in Georgia? Because you were kind of living a big life, working on Wall Street, kind of living that New York dream of sorts, and then slowing way down to Georgia. It was very difficult, Alyssa. I have these conversations with a few of my girlfriends who have also relocated to the South. It's not an easy transition because things are different. The culture is different. And what happens is when you're coming from a big city to a small community, you have these big city ways, big city ideas or big city ways of speaking and thinking. Not that people here are any slower, but that that's not what I'm saying. It's just a different way of thinking. And so trying to meld the two ways of thinking is becomes very complex. You don't want to step on toes. You don't want to offend. 
You don't want to be too fast because it's a slower pace. So I had to learn how to be accepted and, and, and focus on humility. That was the big thing for me. Learning that the way people think here is just different from what I, even from, from New York and from the West Coast. I was just, I was the oddball coming in looking for acceptance. And when I didn't get it the way that I felt I deserved, <laughs> I, I had problems with that. It's interesting. It's something that I hear a lot, quite honestly, of just adapting to different ways of thinking and being and even just the pace of the way people talk or the pace of ideas and, you know, trying to be slow to judge, quick to lend a hand. All of that is such a transition. So I really wondered what your experience was like. I know that you moved into Georgia you tried to get out into the workforce. And I listened to a podcast episode that you were on a few years back. And you talked about this really horrible experience that you had right after you moved to Georgia. And it was one of the reasons why you decided after the passing of your husband to build your own business. And I wondered if you could share that story and offer any advice to folks who've experienced similar discrimination in the workplace on ways to work towards sustainable self-employment. Yeah. So I had been applying for work viciously, you know, coming from New York to Georgia with New York bills. And it, it was very difficult. So I've been putting out resumes and I knew that I was qualified, but I just, you know, I was not getting the call back. So I'm not thinking that my last name had something to do with that. A lot of people automatically assumed, you know, i I was Mexican American. And then when they saw that I was African American woman, that was, you know, that was even worse. So the jobs that were calling me back were jobs like housekeeping, working in gas station, fast food restaurants, things that I had never done. And I felt like, well, you know, I, I'm coming from Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> Why yeah. are you offering me these positions? And I, you know, I just did not want to face the fact that it was discrimination or racism. You know, I went to a position working at a hotel. It was for, I believe it was bookkeeping. I don't even know if they use that term anymore, but back office bookkeeping on the phone. It sounded great. They, they were really welcoming me. They couldn't wait for me to come. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to get this. And they basically said that on the phone too. So interview day, I get there. I'm there 20 minutes early. I'm dressed to the nines in my New York gear, my, my heels and, you know, had on a suit. I'm sitting there. I announced myself and, and the girl said, oh yeah, have a seat. And I'm sitting there and my time has passed and I'm like, wow, I'm here 30 minutes and nothing, you know? So I went up to the desk and I said, hey, I'm Margo Candelario. I had an appointment with you at nine o'clock and, you know, what's going on? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, that position's been filled. And I just, I was just blown away and angry, very angry. You know, for what I felt like, you know, we had this conversation two, three days ago. It was open. You know, what's going on? So when I when I got home feeling defeated, I talked to my husband. I said, Phil, this is what happened. And he said, Margo, you just stay home and I'll work. It was a lot easier for him to find a job than for me. And he, he even had his struggles because somebody approached him and said, listen, are you you know, I don't mean to be rude that microaggression, but are you a light-skinned Black man or are you a white man with a tan? And he said, I'm neither. I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. And they said, that's not even in this country. So, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. So how do you deal with that? You know, what do you say? And, and oftentimes when someone says something that off-putting, you have that look on your face like, you know, did I just hear you right? And then that starts a whole nother conversation, you know, backbiting. Oh, you know, he thinks he's 
he he thinks he's special. He thinks he's better than, you know? So it was it was kind of tough. And he was an electrician in in New York, but he ended up working in corrections. He couldn't even find anything in his profession because of his skin color and his last name. That's deeply, <laughs> deeply upsetting and adds so much more difficulty to making that transition. I mean, I remember moving here and looking at, you know, monster.com or the the job sites and just being in tears because just like what you said, like just what's available is so limiting. And then to have discrimination piled on top of that would make it very challenging. So I know that, you know, you ended up building young female farmers really out of tragedy. And I don't know how much you want to speak about the reasoning behind that. Oh, I, I will. I'll, I'll share because maybe someone will, you know, can benefit from it. We had two daughters and I was pregnant with the third. And my husband was 34 years old. He had a massive heart attack and, and died. And so here I had two babies and um, waiting on the third one alone. Because he was so young, he, he didn't have a lot invested in, you know, working. So Social Security was very low and no one was going to hire me pregnant. And even if I did take one of those jobs at a fast food restaurant, it wasn't going to pay for daycare. One of the reasons why, one of the main reasons we did move to Georgia and he said I could stay home with the girls is because he didn't want the children in daycare. He wanted me to teach them and, and, and be with them, be their mom, you know, if he was able to support us. And that, that's no reflection on people who choose to work by no means. It's just that that's something that we had discussed. In trying to honor what he wanted for his family, I had to figure out a way to support us and not, you know, go outside of the home. And I remembered how my father taught me how to bake. When I was a young girl, he was an entrepreneur. And so that entrepreneurial spirit started to come rise, uh, arise again within me. I started teaching the girls how to bake pies and cakes. And there was a local farmer's market that we attended and we started selling sweet potato pies and, and pound cakes. Nothing with icing, just keeping it simple, just to give the girls an idea of what it was like to start a business. And, have, and commit to it by getting up every Saturday and going to this market for three hours. You know, rain or shine, sick, not sick, wanting to go, wanting to go and play or hang out with their friends, we had committed to this business. And that's what we did for several years. And then it, it grew, I started the garden and that was because my mom had come down here to help me raise the girls and she said, we need a garden. And I think that it wasn't so much about growing food, but she felt that I needed something else to focus on, something that would ground me because I was just so driven to be successful, to teach the girls, to show them that they could be self-sufficient and not have to worry about being stuck holding the bag because Phil was our, our sole support. And so when that was gone, I was scared. And I, and I did have the option to go back to New York. Mom said, you know, you can always come home, but that's not what Phil wanted. And it's a decision that I made. A lot of people probably would have gone back to their comfort zone, but I wanted to honor him. And there were some perks to staying here in Georgia, which I now know. Just in time for your holiday shopping, we are excited to announce our partnership with Kennebec Forge, a Maine-made heirloom quality garden hand tool business. Designed by Hostel Valley Living homesteader, Kirsten Lee Nielsen, and crafted by master blacksmith, Derek Glazier, founder of the New England School of Metalwork. Hand forged with locally sourced materials, these tools are as tough as nails and made to stand the test of time. They are the perfect gift for the cultivators in your life. This limited run is selling out fast. Get one before they're gone. Order by December 13th for Christmas delivery. 
Visit urbanexodus.com slash shop to learn more. I wonder if you had any advice. I mean, you suffered such a tragic loss at such a young age and, and you have kids. Like, you just have to keep going for them. Do you have any advice for anyone that maybe is listening to this that maybe is going through a really similar time in their lives, suffering a tragedy on ways to find the light or direction and build something and honor that person that you've lost? It's important to remember that we have to focus on one day at a time and not always look at the big picture. Sometimes if you have a quiet moment, you can sit down and write and make a plan. Don't be so hard on yourself because there is no textbook on how you're supposed to take one step at a time in your shoes. We're all so different. We all process things differently. And, and if you believe in prayer, you, you ask that maybe that tragedy is not taken away, but that you're given strength to endure it. I had to learn that I, this is not something that I can go around. I have to go through it because if you go around it, you miss the story. And the story is what has brought me to the point that I'm at right now. And that's what I pass on. When people come to visit and they ask about the farm and the art and the books and, and how am I able to do all of that, it's, it's because I take every moment as it comes and process it at that moment. Being really intentional and kind of going with the flow of sorts. <laughs> yes. You know, what are you going to do? I remember one particular day when Phil had passed, my mom was at the house. She had taken off for two weeks from work and I was in the bathroom in the tub and she knocked on the door and she said, I know you're in your happy place right now, soaking in the tub, but you can't stay there because the girls need their mom. They're hungry. The clothes need to be washed. There's things that need to be done. And she said, I'm here now, but I have to go back to work. I can't stay here. And just that reality made me realize that I, this, this is my life. This is what's happening right now. And as a parent, I have to step up. So your mom came to help you and Young Female Farmers was initially pies. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about moving into the farming space. I know it started as a garden that expanded. Could you talk a little bit about the evolutions and pivots that you've made to build the sustainable farm-based business? The most important thing about our business was marketing and figuring out where we fit in because there are so many farms. Everyone, there are people that are doing some fantastic things with the, the spaces that they have. So it should never, it was never a competition for me. It was figuring out how young female farmers is important to our community, how we can become even more important, how we can teach people what we've learned over, the, over a period of time, how we can extend ourselves to those who, who are less fortunate and give them the tools to grow and market themselves with what they have. And so the, the farming, we started with the garden, a small garden, and it just increased. And then we started, of course, we were already at the farmer's market so we could see what people were bringing in and what people were asking for. And we just kind of filled that, that niche market. There weren't a lot of people bringing in sweet potatoes. So we grew sweet potatoes. Just, you know, things like that. Never really big on tomatoes because everybody grows tomatoes. So I wanted to, to do the things that we didn't see. The reason for leaving the farmer's market is because I discovered we weren't serving the, 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 the people that I felt we needed to reach people of color. I saw people of color being shuttled in to the market 
almost as an oddity. I know that that wasn't the intention, but that's the feeling that I got. They walked around and kind of felt a little disoriented because there were a lot of vegetables that people of color were not accustomed to. You know, traditionally, well, years ago, you know, people of color had gardens. So they had a relationship with collard greens and okra and corn and and tomatoes and green beans. But over time, because of fast food, we've gotten away from eating foods like that, home-cooked meals. So I'm seeing a generation of people coming in who don't know that vegetables don't come out of a can. You know, so if you're walking around a farmer's market and you see kohlrabi and arugula, you you don't even, you can't identify that. You don't know what that is. You know what cabbage is, you know what collards are, and you know corn. Everybody knows corn. But when you start getting into things that may appear to be a little exotic, you're embarrassed to ask what it is. And you're certainly not going to ask how to cook it. So I would see them walk around and and look and, and leave with fast food, not the vegetables that they should have been wanting to get. Or they might pick up some fruit because everybody likes fruit. And I thought, this is, this is not what this market should be about. It's for the community. Community means everyone. And another thing is that the pricing was outrageous. You know, $5 a pound. If you're used to going to KFC or Church's Chicken or Bojangles and you can get a 12-piece bucket with sides for eight. $10, why would you spend $5 a pound for okra? What was your solution? I see you as a solutionary. <laughs> yeah. So what, what I did was I bought a trailer, a concession style trailer, put the vegetables that we grew on the trailer, as well as went to the farmer's market in Atlanta, where I, I had access to more a variety and also worked with some local farmers to put certain things on the truck too. And I went into some of these food deserts and talked to the people, my mom, my daughters, and I would get out there in the community and open up the truck and, and, and just have these conversations about food. We also gave out recipes on how to cook the food. And we, I would hear all kinds of stories, neat stories about, yeah, you know, my grandmother used to make okra from us and then somebody else would say, oh yeah, what about that cabbage? And, and you know, they were wonderful memories, but, but then I said, so what happened that you're not cooking? And, you know, there was this long pause, like, I don't have time. Well, why not? Priority, it wasn't a priority because it was just much easier for you to go to Walmart and get, you know, this food and bring it home and put it on a paper plate and say and sit the kid in front of the TV and say, eat up and entertain yourself. And that's not how I grew up. You know, and I know it's it's not about my generation. A lot of people are like, yeah, that was then, this is now. And I get that. But when a child comes into this world, it's a blank page and their brains are, you know, malleable. And what if you put in two cents, you're gonna get back two cents with a story. You know, they can they can take what they want from it, good or bad, but it, it's an experience. And, and that's what I wanted to give my children. And that's what I try to do when I do go out into the community communities is talk to people and just bond and find that place where we have a meeting of the minds. And then we realize, hey, we're not that different after all. It's only through connection and conversation that I feel like real progress can be made. And that's beautiful. If you could transport yourself back to the early days of your business, what, if any, advice do you wish you could have told yourself? I probably would have benefited from some classes in marketing. As an artist, a visual artist, I would often go to shows and I would bring my children, and I would say before we walked in, now there's going to be some pieces there that you're not going to get. And we called it, huh, art, like, huh, you know, but what I want you to do is find something. If, if it's only one thing in that art that you like, 
whether it's the eyes, the lips, hands, something, find something in that piece that you like so that you leave with a positive experience. And so marketing was key because I couldn't understand, well, how is it that this piece ends up in this particular environment, in this, in this museum, in this gallery? And it's about marketing. So I said that to say, you know, round robin with farming and our business with the baked goods and the vegetables and it, it's about marketing and, and putting us out there. We have been, I've written a couple of articles for Food Tank. We have been in Southern Living Magazine. We're always in the new, the local newspaper. And then we're quite visible on uh, Instagram and Facebook. So people like to know what you're doing. They like to see and they want to see progress and they want to see positive stories. If I could go back, then I probably would have focused a little bit more on the marketing aspect. If I could, because remember, it was just really me as the adult. My mom was here to help, but she, you know, she wasn't social media savvy or marketing savvy per se. So it's a lot on one individual. It's hard to learn. <laughs> it, is, it is hard to learn and run the business at the same time. But I think that my brain, I've been wired to be able to do several things at once. Every, everybody can't do that. And what happens is that at the end of the year, then you kind of fall apart. So which is <laughs> what I'm experiencing right now. That is almost a requirement of farmers, really. And, you know, all small business owners to a certain degree is you have to be good at all of the things. <laughs> but to add farming to that, which is such a physically taxing job, it, the burnout would be really high. And you are a single mom. And a single mom. Yes, yes. And my mom is 83 years old. So she's actually starting to feel it now. So, you know, we kind of watch her and make sure that she's not staying out too long because she's she's so competitive. But what we do, <laughs> what we do is we have a standing appointment with the, the chiropractor. That is absolutely necessary to keep us mobile. If I didn't have a relationship with um, my chiropractor, I would not be able to farm the entire summer season because I, I, I'm 57 years old. I'm no spring chicken, but the body work, massages, and chiropractic care is absolutely necessary for us to keep going. So I photographed hundreds of farms at this point, and every farm looks different at every place I visit. I'd love for you to describe your home, your land, and your farm, and kind of talk about the crops that you grow and forage and the creatures that you keep. My property is three and a half acres of land acres, and then I have an acre pond. We It's spring-fed, and we have it fully stocked with bass, brim, crappie, and catfish. No one fishes but me, but that's fine because that's my happy place. We also have two horses. I would say the area that we farm is not that big. It's fenced in at about 110 feet by 100 feet, which is huge when you're in there pulling weeds, but not as big as some people <laughs> work. It's fenced because I'm surrounded by 800 acres of woods and every creature that grow that lives in Georgia lives in those hundred that eight hundred acre wood, including the deer. So we have a ten foot fence, which has kept the deer out for probably about ten years now. We've not had any problems with them jumping inside and and mowing down the okra. So our specialty is okra. This year we grew four different varieties, and I have some video on my Instagram feed showing mom in the okra and it's just covering her up. Some of it was like 13 feet tall. Yeah, it can get so tall. <laughs> it can. They're like trees. They are really like trees. So we did okra. We do several varieties of tomatoes. We had green beans. We grow bitter melon. We have figs, nectarines, pears, 
Normally we grow sweet potatoes and watermelon, but this year we did not. You know, every year it's something different. I, I'm um, a seed catalog junkie. So I flip through the pages and I'm like, I want to try this. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I have so many dog-eared page stuff. <laughs> yes. But, you know, as when you're growing food for people, you have to grow what people are going to buy. It just can't be about what you want. You know, it's you're serving in the community. So last year we had corn, but this year we did not. So, you know, we kind of change up. And I'm not quite sure we're going to grow next spring and summer just because I'm going to give the land a rest. It's almost like the Jubilee year. You know, the Israelites had a Jubilee every seven years. So I think (laughs) I'm going to let the land rest and decide on whether I'm going to actually do row cropping. We talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but, you know, I know that you had a hard year this year and you know, you've been battling illness and and not feeling well. and Yeah, we we did have an intern and I was able, a sweet girl, she's a Girl Scout that volunteered to come over and, and help us out because my youngest had a heart condition or has a heart condition and actually had surgery, heart surgery in September. And she's recuperating and she's doing her physical therapy and the, the surgery was successful. That was scary. And, and, and here she felt like she was letting us down because she couldn't get out and help us in the garden. So it's been rough, but I feel like I'm on the mend. I, I am allowed to be tired and accept that. I can sit down and, and have some tea and not have to be outside. So I have a habit of standing out at the window and looking and finding things that need to be done. <laughs> And my family is always telling me, Mommy, why don't you just sit down? And if I'm not (laughs) doing the garden, then I'm painting. If I'm not painting, I'm writing poetry. And I I just have to do something or, you know, or I'm sweeping or I'm dusting. When When you're a homeowner, there's always, especially when you're single, you know, and there's no man around, there's always something to be done if you want to keep your home up. Because, you know, the the grass and the trees will grow up around you and swallow you up. They were here first. And yeah, it's that never ending to do list. And for productive minded individuals, I am very similar, Margo. I feel the same way. People are just like, just sit down. (laughs) Just like put your feet up for a second. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think we make them tired watching us. Uh, definitely. <laughs> you mentioned it, but in addition to farming, you're also a prolific artist and writer. And so I'd love for you to talk about these other passions and how you structure your life so you have enough time to balance it all. Well, structuring my life to balance it all. You know what I what I do is I, I do it in seasons, I think. If I'm tired of the farm, then I paint. Or if something is happening in my life, then I paint or I write. And that's how the writing started. I had wrote several poems and I let someone read them. This is right after Phil had died. And they said, wow, this is, you know, this is good stuff. I said, you think so? They said, yeah, join this writer's group. So I joined the writer's group. And next thing I know, I asked a friend of mine if he could put the book together for me. And we'll talk a little bit about him too. And so he puts the book together for me and does the artwork because at that time my art had ceased. I was just grieving and I couldn't create, but I could write. Well, the book was nominated author of the year by the Georgia Writers Association. And we got to get dressed up and they had this nice event at Mercer University and Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter at that time were nominated also. And of course they won. But I got to be in good company. So that was my first <laughs> my first attempt. That's amazing. It, yeah. And I had I was like, wow, I've never written poetry before in my life. So that was huge. Then I did a CD where I recorded the the poetry to jazz of a friend in New York that does jingles. And he he did the music for me. And that was pretty successful. I actually took the the book and the the CD on tour, and 
touring, I, I took the girls everywhere I went because I didn't have family. My mom wasn't here at that time yet. She hadn't retired. So everywhere I went, the girls went with me. So they've been exposed to the art shows and I have art now from New York City to Hawaii. You're very brave and kind of like following your dreams and taking risks. And I wondered if you had any advice for people that have big dreams or maybe they want to move to the country or maybe they want to, you know, finish that book that they have waiting in the wings. What advice would you give them or encouragement to kind of just go for their dreams? I think it's really important to sit down and have a conversation with yourself and ask why. Why do you have an interest in that? Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to move there? And research the culture. I mean, because as far as farming is concerned, there are a lot of people I see on Instagram who want to farm, but for what reason? Is it because you've heard you can make a lot of money? Is it because you want to connect to the soil? Is it because you want to grow food for your family? Is it because you want to grow food for the community? Is it because that you want to get into herbalism and, and you want to help people? Is it because you want to educate people? Is it because you want to educate yourself? So once you discover the reason behind your interest then you set out a plan and do it. Really connecting to the why. I think that's such good advice. I know that there are a lot of people, obviously, like you said, that want to learn how to farm. But I think that there are real barriers in farming, specifically when it comes to access to land and farm capital to like get your operations going. Do you have any advice to people who maybe don't have access to capital or land on ways to get their feet wet in farming and try it out? I think that through social media, there there are so many people out there that might be local who have land who would welcome someone to come over, especially because farmers are aging. We're in, you know, 58, 60, 70 year old age range now, and they can't do the work that they did, you know, 30 years ago. So reach out to them and say, hey, listen, I'd like to learn. How do you get your tomatoes to grow like that? Can I come over and learn? Most people will say yes. Can I learn about those plants over there, those those supposed weeds? Can I learn, you know, about the, the herbs that you have? Can I just come over and, and hang out with you maybe one weekend a month? And then that can turn out to, well, how about you come over, you know, every Wednesday? And if that doesn't work out, that's, that's fine. Then you, you don't stop there. You go to someone else. In the meantime, I'm a huge advocate of reading. Read. People, there are so many people who no longer read. I don't understand. I, I, I'm reading something every single day. It's not about farming. It could be in, about anything and everything. I need to stay focused on what's going on in the world, not just in my bubble. You know, what's happening outside of my community? What's happening in other countries? How are people farming, you know, in Africa? How are people farming in South America? What kind of plants are they propagating? What, what's going on? So that I can, you know, stay abreast of what's happening in our economy. I just wanted to give an enormous thank you to all of you listeners who have made contributions toward the production of this podcast. Every season, I spend about 100 hours preparing, writing, editing, interviewing, and distributing the podcast. And I have hard costs for my editor and for those hosting fees. And it really means so much to me that you find enough meaning and value in this podcast to pledge your support and to keep it going. And if you haven't had a chance to contribute, we've made it really easy for you. Just click the support button on the top of Urban Exodus website and pledge any amount that you like. Thank you again. I really couldn't continue to do this work without you. Yeah, I think that that's really good advice, reaching out to the people that are already doing it. And just, I mean, there are just so many resources out there, so many books that you could dive into and learn just a myriad of things. 
beyond university. (laughs) That's right. Just because you don't have access to land doesn't mean you can't prepare yourself for the time that you do have it. Because if it's something that you really want, you, you know, you can get it. That kind of ties into my next question, because part of your offerings at Female Farmer Project are wild crafted tinctures and herbal root infusions, which I said before, I use in my smoothies every morning. Yes. <laughs> when did you first get your start in herbalism and how did you learn and what are some of your favorite plant allies that you use in your products? In the African-American community, we are raised to depend on and lean upon herbs from tea to poultice, poultices, you know. So that's just something that I grew up with. And my mom, her grandmother was Gullah Geechee. And those things are passed down. You know, I remember when I was a little girl, my grandmother would tell me to boil onions and honey and drink it, boil it down and drink that for chest colds. So it's just a part of our culture. As far as what grows here, I started discovering that there were certain plants on my property. And I thought, well, you know, because I don't call myself an herbalist by no means. There's so many plants to learn about. I only focus on what grows here and try to learn as much as I can about them. So we have yellow dock, which grows in my horse pasture, and it's prolific. It's it's so prolific that grass doesn't even grow in the horse pasture. The horses don't eat it because it's very bitter. But when you start studying herbal medicine, you learn that bitters are very important for digestion. So I started learning about all the uh, attributes of the yellow dock or curly dock plant and learned about the tincturing and teas. So we have yellow dock here. We also have sweet gum trees, which they do grow up in the north. I'm not sure how far up north they do grow, the northern part of the United States, but we have them here. And sweet gum is the same, it has the same constituents that Tamiflu has. And a lot of people don't know that. Now, do you know what the sweet gum ball is? Yeah, I've seen them before. They're really cool. They're like kind of a prickly little, they almost look like a cherry size, right? Yes, exactly. Uh huh. So you have to use those when they're green and there's just a, a thing that you do with them and it's good for flus and colds without, you know, getting too, you know, because you, you have to be careful what you say now about viruses, but... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So sweet gum. I grow bitter melon, which is that that fruit that looks like a prickly cucumber. Are you fam- familiar with that? Yes, I've seen them before. I've never grown them, but oh, that is a plant. That's it's a wonder plant because it takes care of so many ailments and brings the body back into balance. It's anti-inflammatory. It supports the liver and the pancreas. It's great for diabetics, hair, skin. So, and I'm, I'm learning something new about that plant every day. And then the fourth plant is the mullen. Mullen is for respiratory support. And that's the, the big, beautiful green plant that has the fur It almost feels like a dog's ear or something. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, so there there are a couple of things out here that, um, there are other things that also grow here, and I have mint that I use too. So I just kind of focus on what's here on my land without getting all into everybody else's business. I just (laughs) work (laughs) with what I have here, and that definitely keeps me occupied. Beyond the benefits of eating fresh, nutrient-dense food, the act of growing can be incredibly therapeutic and healing. I'd love for you to discuss your relationship with growing food and the way it's made an impact in your life, both from a mental health standpoint and just everyday physical health. I adore nature and creation. And so anytime that I'm outside and I'm breathing fresh air and I'm I'm looking at rabbits hopping along, or even if it's a snake, you know, it might be a little startling, but 
those are the things that keep me grounded and, and let me know that nature is so much bigger than I am. Even though I've been blessed to have the skills that I do have or the ability to pivot, as, as you said, I realize that nature does it 24-7. I have my moments, but this is creation does it all the time, constantly. And that's why we are still here, you know, so I can reflect on my life when I'm outside. I, I pray. I have memories of my childhood. I think about my dad who's passed away. I think about my grandma. I have my mother here with me still, and we can laugh and dig in the dirt, and I feel safe. My, my farm is my safe haven. Nothing touches me from the outside world here on my land. That's so beautiful. Your mother is in her, you know, now mid-80s. Yeah, she's 83. She's 83. But she still plays an active role in the farm business. How does she, like, prevent injuries? Do you have any advice to extend the years that you can actively farm? Well, my mom was always very active in her youth and continued. Always stretched, always exercised. She swam. She played tennis. She rode her bike. You know, she was always moving. And then in New York, walking. Walked for miles, for blocks. So even here, she'll stretch and, and bend before she goes outside. And, you know, when you get older, you have to take it slow and you have to look down and watch out for the, the, uh, the potholes, out in the, you know, in the, in the yard. And, of course, we argue about her getting the lighter shovel because she wants to get the heavy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, she wants to dig all the holes and so we have to we have to agree on certain things that, you know, she she can do. But what keeps her going is her mind, you know, willpower. And, and when I was a little girl, she used to always tell me if it's something that you want to do, you can do it. And I believed her. I believed her. And I told the girls, my girls the same thing. You know, and some of some of it stuck, some of it didn't. But for me, when my mother told me I can do whatever I want, I believed it. And that's my advice. You know, it's easy to, to throw out pros and advice to people, but you have to believe it to achieve it. In your original Urban Exodus feature, you said parents must do their part in educating their children about spirituality, respect for their neighbor and nature, mental and physical health and justice. And this really resonated with me. And as the mother of three girls, you know, you just gave us a kernel of wisdom there, but I wondered if you had any other advice for parents who are listening on ways to teach those fundamentals to their child, especially if they aren't getting that focused learning in school. Parents have to take the responsibility of learning themselves in order to teach. If you're not continuously learning new things, then it's difficult to teach your child something new. I think that, as I mentioned earlier, reading is probably 80% of the game read anything. If, if it's a paragraph a day, you know, learn a new word. We spent countless hours when my children were young playing word games, the alphabet game where we would have to go through the alphabet and name a country. And each time we got through Z and started over again, you couldn't use the same couldn't use the same A country or the same B country <laughs> before, you know, because that, that was cheating. Yeah. We played Scrabble. We did crossword puzzles and every summer they would have required reading from school, but they had my own, I gave them my own list also. And I taught them to read the classics. And, you know, there's some things that you're not going to like, but that's okay because I wanted them to be able to sit in any conversation that they were invited into and be able to contribute. I mean, there's nothing worse than someone, you're sitting in a, in a group of people and they're talking over your head. Uh, it's, it's terrible, you know? So you may not know everything about what they're talking about, but you certainly know something because you've been exposed to it. I was telling someone this story the other day about how 
When I moved to New York and was going to school, it was required that we had to read the newspaper before we got to the, you know, world history or American history. And that, and the teacher would say to us, you don't have to read the New York Times, but it, you better be reading the Daily News and not the Post. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, sh- and we didn't know what she was going to ask us, but we had to go through that paper, you know. And so I taught my girls the same thing. Read the paper. Find out what's going on in your environment so that you are included in what's going on and you can contribute in the conversation and in the dialogue and not just be that wallflower. I wondered what legacy that you would like to leave behind for your family and for future generations, people that maybe aren't in your family too. Learn to be self-sufficient and not dependent on anyone. And I'm not, it's not just about government. It's don't be dependent upon anyone. Learn how to sustain yourself. Learn how to entertain yourself because life is not promised. And that's what I learned when Phil passed away that, you know, he was, as far as I knew, he was a 34 year old healthy man. He was 155 pounds, six one. Who would have thought he'd have a heart attack? And so that that was what shocked me into reality that even though we always say, people always say, yeah, life is, you just never know. You know, I've heard that, but you don't. And when it happens, you want to be able to stand up on your feet and keep moving. Yeah, everybody's allowed that time to sit down and 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 cry and grieve, but through that grief, you still have to move forward because people will run over you and you get left behind. And that's what I didn't want for me or for my children. I didn't want them to be a statistic. I didn't want them to be left behind or looked at as, oh, those poor little people over there, that woman and her three kids. I didn't want that. And we are the total opposite of that, where look at that woman and her three children, her grown women now who are very successful. My youngest, Trey, she just graduated in May from Harvard in applied mathematics. My middle daughter, yes, even through her heart condition. My middle daughter is in pharmacy and my oldest is a nurse administrator. So even though they don't always do what I think they should do, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the mom, you know, I don't always like the decisions that they make. They are self, they're self-sufficient. And so my mother reminds me, Marco, you did a good job. And that's all I want. You absolutely did. I mean, you have been through such kind of suffering through that heartbreak, that grief, but you have overcome and you have created this really beautiful foundation for your family and you've really carried on your husband Phil's legacy through your work as well. How can people find you, follow your journey, learn from you and support your business into the future? Well, we do have a website, which is youngfemalefarmers.com. We also have the Instagram account, which is Young Female Farmers, and we have Facebook, Young Female Farmers, and we have Twitter, Young Female Farm. So we're on all the social media, and I we try to keep it current and, and relevant. We also have classes. We do Zoom classes now because of COVID. When things move forward and, and kind of open up, then we can still we can have classes here again. We can resume that, which a lot of people really enjoy coming to the farm and because it's hands-on and they get to experience the whole the horses, the pond and the art and the books and all of that, you know, and, and the kitchen, everybody loves the kitchen and to see where it all started, the baking and all of that. So yeah, that's what we do. We just, we have classes and we teach and we welcome people. And of course you have to make an appointment. You can't just ride up on us. <laughs> yeah. Don't show up at people's farms without right. making an appointment first. <laughs> that's right. We actually had a family come from Florida last spring. 
And they they stayed in the hotel and they came out to the farm and we did the tour and we had lunch for them and they really enjoyed themselves. So I like that because that connection is so important. I learned from it too. I want to know what, what everybody else is doing. That's what helps me, you know, move forward too. I can't wait until you come and visit. I can't wait until I come and visit. <laughs> uh, I want to pet your horses and yes. I want to walk amongst the okra trees. Yes, yes. <laughs> and learn from you and see your art and all of that. I'll end it on one last question. I feel like as a world, we have gone through this collective trauma of COVID in like the last two years and being separated from people. And we're living in a time that feels particularly contentious and polarized and difficult. What has this difficult time taught you and how are you carrying that into your work and processes in the future? Because I'm a Bible reader, I'm not surprised and and I expected it. So it, it has not affected what I do or, or how I move or how I think. I'm always focused on my purpose. And whenever I can help somebody learn about becoming self-sufficient, growing their own food, that's what I do. It has been a a difficult time, I agree, for so many, but I'm okay. And I always ask God to help me to endure because we can't do it by ourselves. And I think that's part of the problem. We're always looking to man for answers instead of God. Now I have a follow-up question because that was such an interesting response. For people that feel like they're lost, they don't know what their purpose is. Maybe they have tuned into themselves during this very kind of inward time and felt like, oh, everything that I've been doing is not fulfilling me. Almost, you know, kind of how you are feeling when you're working on Wall Street and you're like, what am I doing right now? This isn't fulfilling me. Do you have any advice for people on ways to tap into themselves, into that inner voice and figure out what their purpose is and how to work towards it? Now, that's a loaded question. <laughs> that really is. I, well, I would first have to ask that person if they have a, a, a spiritual connection to anything. We have to answer to someone. And I think people that don't, are really kind of lost. And then you a- you have to ask, why? Why aren't you? Because there's, everything is by design. Nothing just happens. You know, when you have a, when you, you have an idea to build a house, the house doesn't just appear because it's something that you want. It has to be engineered and built by a builder, correct? If you Don't look to a higher power for help and for answers. That might be the reason for the loss or that that missing space because you, you don't have anyone to answer to. And sometimes that could even be like an internal voice, right? Like it could feel like it doesn't even necessarily have to be under like a a name or it's it's, it's no, it's yeah, you got to listen to something. Because, yeah. <laughs> because there's there can't just be wasted space in between your two ears. What are you connecting to? Figure out what it is that moves you, that motivates you, that makes you dance. Is it is it music? Is it a particular lyric? What resonates and makes you feel alive? And connect to that. Sometimes we're in our own way. That is a problem. When you cannot move out of your own way, that means you lack humility. And and we talked a little bit about that when I first moved down here and learning to adapt that attribute. It's an attribute. It's not a sign of weakness. It says you're willing to allow another idea to come inside and accept it. You can accept it or not accept it, but allow it. Allow yourself the opportunity to enjoy a new idea. But it takes humility to do that. Margot, I could talk with you all day. I feel like you have imparted so much wisdom on me. And 
hopefully on the people listening to this podcast. And I just love your, your spirit and your energy and the way that you intentionally move through your life and the impact that you're making through your work. So I just really appreciate you speaking with me today so much. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. I can't wait until we can actually sit down here and break bread and laugh and talk and, you know, just hang out. I look forward to that day too. Yes. Thank you so much for having me, Alyssa. I I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Margot Candelario. She is the embodiment of strength and her story is so powerful to listen to. She has found healing and salvation in the soil and has spread her love and gifts throughout her community. Margot's story speaks to the fierceness of a mother's love and the human spirit, both of which carried her through a period of unimaginable grief and into a beautiful new chapter. I hope Margot's story offers strength and guidance to anyone listening who is navigating tragedy or past traumas. I also hope she inspired anyone feeling unfulfilled in their current career or overwhelmed balancing a stressful job and raising kids to think about building your own small business. The best way to build something is to reach out to your community and assess what might be missing locally. It can start as a side hustle and grow into something that can offer you more autonomy over your own life and a sustainable livelihood that could be passed down to the next generation. Family-run businesses certainly aren't for everyone, but I know that in Margot's case, she feels extremely blessed to be able to work alongside her mother and daughters and to build a connection to her land and to her community. I wanna thank Margot so much for sharing her story. You can find photos of Margot and of her farm and links to her work and more on the blog by visiting urbanexodus.com. Hi friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Urban Exodus podcast. Urban Exodus is a labor of love and is only made possible by listener support. I do this work because the people I meet through this project give me energy and hope for the future. My mission is to promote the work of people manifesting good in the world. We are living in a time where there's an overwhelming feeling of dread, and I want this project to encourage people to be proactive and work towards finding creative solutions for both their individual happiness and our collective experience. You can support this work by clicking the support button at the top of urbanexodus.com, by buying an ad spot in an upcoming episode, by shopping our online store, or taking an in-person or online course through our workshops at Howhill Farm. We are also slowly getting our Patreon page together, and we'll be adding bonus features and other content there. So check out patreon.com slash urbanexodus to learn more. Another way to support is by giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and recommending Urban Exodus to your friends. Thank you again for helping me continue to do this work. I couldn't do it without all of you. You can find Urban Exodus on Instagram and Facebook at The Urban Exodus. To read more in-depth features on folks who ditched the city and went country, visit urbanexodus.com. Until next time, I'm Alyssa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus. 